Oh my god, unbelievable! People have no shame, I can't believe this! Even though I clearly labeled my coat of arms with original work, do not steal, to indicate that my personal emblem, which cannot be used by anyone else, is a drawing of Sonic the Hedgehog fist-bumping boss baby. Has this happened to you? Hi, I'm Stephen Hogbreath, Esquire. I'd have a Master of Laws from the University of Aberdeen in Heraldic Law Services. My team will stand up for you. You have rights. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Well, the Heraldic Code gives you rights. The Heraldic Court gives you rights. And I'm here to fight for you for a very, 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 very low fee in cash. Wow, how much is it? It's only the low, low price of 25 bushels of wheat up front. That's no problem. I guess I can just raid the storehouse. That's right. Don't let this happen to you. We will secure your unique heraldry today. Send a page boy with a letter today. Thank you, Stephen Hogbreath. That's Stephen Hogbreath Esquire to you. Sorry, Stephen Hogbreath Esquire to you. <laughs> That's right. Stephen Hogbreath, he's Esquire to you. <laughs> The feast is all. Now brimming wine in lordly cup is seen to shine before each eager guest. And silence fills the crowded hall, as deep as when the herald's call thrills in the loyal breast. Welcome back to the Weird Medieval Guys podcast, and we are going to be flying our Weird Medieval Guys flags particularly high today. I'm Olivia, and this is Aaron, a page boy with a trumpet. Fuck, how did you know? <laughs> you were holding your hands up like you were going to do a trumpet. How did you... That's That That was scary. That was... Anyway. I'm in your head. Cut all this. Now introducing... The Lady Swathout of the Far East. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. This week, we're talking heraldry and how you can go all Blue Peter on it, a phrase that Olivia has just learned today, mm -hmm. and uh, make your own coat of arms. That's right. By the end of this episode, you are going to have all the knowledge that you need to create a personal emblem that encapsulates you. But you can't use Sonic Fist Bumping Boss Baby, because that's already taken. <laughs> well, you joke. But in preparation for this episode, we actually did something a little bit unhinged, and we went and designed each other's coat of arms. Yeah. So we're going to be walking you through the two coats of arms that we've designed for one another uh, as a little sort of how-to guide. Should we do that now? Yeah. Can you right. go grab them? Yeah. Uh, I think we should describe each other's coats of arms. Or, sorry, describe the coats of arms that we've been given. Okay, okay. Oops. Um, so, I just want to um, get it out of the way and say that Aaron <laughs> completely one-upped me on this. <laughs> because mine was made with clip art that I pasted together and then traced with colored pencil. And um, he showed up and handed me an actual canvas with paint on it. <laughs> So, um... You're not the only one who can be artistic, right? <laughs> I have hidden depths. <laughs> I have a hinterland. So, um, I'm holding in my hand this beautiful little canvas. Um, so it's got a, a shield in the center. I think this is a sort of triangular shield that would be known as a heater in the Middle Ages. Um, it's a red shield with a white diagonal stripe across it and a black sheep in the middle. It's got a crown on top of it, and it's being held up by two amphibians that I'm going to hazard a guess are a frog and a toad. Yes, they are a frog and a toad. And at the top it says, as my motto on a little banner, <laughs> ain't that just the way? <laughs> Which is notably a phrase from Over the Garden Wall, one of my favorite shows. A show that you force people to watch every year. I do. It's one of the great joys of the autumn. We don't mind. Um... And so you have, I would say, you've, you've sort of out undersold yourself because you have handed me a very detailed, I would say a more detailed, um, coat of arms. Um, so we've got a shield with, um, it's sort of divided into four, and in the top left-hand corner, it's white, 
and we've got um, a sort of garland of flowers. Top left-hand corner, green. We've got a pint of beer. We're choosing not to take that personally. Um, and uh, dot bottom left-hand corner is a horse on a green field, and bottom right-hand corner is a hammer on a white field. And at the top, on, on top of the shield, you have a sort of crown with a ship on top of it, and on either side, there's an elephant and a bird. And underneath the crown, oh, sorry, and underneath the shield, you have a little banner that reads, Tempora a patari disit. Is that anything like what it's supposed to be? No idea. I don't speak Latin. Uh, well, write in the comments. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. So we've got a little, we've each chosen a little agglomeration of different symbols that we've arranged in a specific way, according to specific rules, which is, I think, more or less, you could say, what heraldry entails. So... That brings us, I think, onto what heraldry kind of is. Because I think one of the reasons why I sort of demanded we do an episode on this is because I think it falls into the category of things that are ubiquitously medieval, but are very rarely sort of interrogated in popular culture. It's like, you know, that, you know, the great houses should, of course, have coat of arms. And anybody who watches Game of Thrones will, like, know, you know. Oh, that was, those are the wolf ones. Those mm -hmm. are the uh, those are the deer ones. <laughs> yep. That one's an octopus. What? Is there an octopus one? I think so. Those are the pirate ones. So yeah, the heraldry is a form of sort of to be anachronistic, a form of personal branding, which it can be used to identify a person or an organization. And it should be mentioned as well that heraldry, technically speaking, doesn't just encompass um, these personal symbols, but also the entire field of titling and nobility and uh, pedigree, as it's called, which I think sounds a bit off color, but is basically, you know, the study and system systematic representation of people's lineages. But I think coats of arms are sort of the most iconic parts of it. Although I should also mention that what we refer to as a coat of arms most often isn't actually a coat of arms, but rather an armorial achievement or a heraldic achievement. The coat of arms, technically speaking, is just the shield. Right, yeah. I mean, because the, the origin of coat of arms is wonderfully literal. It's the part of the symbol that you embroider over your surcoat, so it is literally a coat of arms, because the study and design and analysis of these symbols was very much a science in the Middle Ages, and it was referred to as the science of armory. That's mm -hmm. spelled armory without the U. Just pretend you're American. <laughs> so hence, it's a coat of arms. Exactly. Isn't that delightful? It's one of those things you think, oh, surely it doesn't come <laughs> from the word coat like a jacket, but it does. We. Oui. And I hope you'll forgive me as well. During this episode, I will be bringing up a few coats of arms that are not strictly medieval, some more recent ones as well, because the heraldic tradition is a really fun tradition that was started a bit later on in the Middle Ages, but was absolutely carried on by people afterwards all the way up to present day. Yeah, it's very much, I mean, we talked in the Jesters episode about these things that are very much associated as sort of classically medieval, but in fact sort of reached their apogee in the sort of early modern period. Jesters are one example, and I'd say that armory and coats of arms are also in, in that boat, despite the fact that we really do associate them with the high Middle Ages. In fact, you know, for most of the Middle Ages, this is not a thing that people are doing, and it's certainly not a thing that is systematized. So, like, societies all over the world use symbols as sort of ways to project authority. The Roman eagle is maybe the most sort of famous example. That's the one that also has been sort of taken and remixed a thousand times over the war over the years. But if you saw the Roman eagle um, on a coin, on a banner, anywhere basically in the during the during the Roman Empire's sort of height, you knew, oh crap, it's the Romans. <laughs> these the, these guys are serious. Um, and you know, and that's why I think you see you see the, that kind of design in complex societies basically everywhere around the world. One of the things that I found really interesting when re researching this episode is the sort of way in which historians in the nineteenth and uh, early twentieth century very sort of excitedly are saying, "And you know, even the indigenous peoples of the Americas have their own coats of arms." <laughs> it's like, of course they do. 
so, because yeah. there's like there those are civilizations as well. Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, the sort of the sort of vaguely patronizing racism of early twentieth century history aside, um, I th I raise that example purely because I think it's a it's a universal thing to want to have a visual symbol of power. Yeah, and I think we'll get sort of more into this later on, but there's definitely a distinction to be made between all of these personal symbols, which yeah. arguably were precursors to heraldry and to arms and sort of the formalized coat of arms and the heraldic achievement as we know it. But it, it was definitely a organic development mm. from personal individual symbols into these highly regulated, um, highly sort of complex representations. Yeah, I mean, we have, we, so if we look at the sources, you can kind of trace the, the origin of coats of arms as, as a formalized thing over the course of the Middle Ages. So, for example, the Bayo Tapestry, which is, of course, the famous tapestry that depicts the, um, the Norman conquest of England. Um, lots, of, lots of soldiers in that tapestry are carrying symbols on their shields, but those symbols are not associated with specific people, and, they're not, and they are not consistent to specific characters as the tapestry sort of goes on, because, of course, it is telling a story over its length. Um, and then, of course, by the period of the Crusades, we have accounts of people carrying personal banners into battle, but if these are not really coats of arms as we traditionally understand them because they're not associated with family. They are non-hereditary. And so it's not really until approximately the sort of 12th, 13th century that we start to see the idea of a formal coat of arms develop. And this is pretty simple in the beginning. It's mostly restricted to a shield and symbols on the shields, which reflects the practical origins of this is something you are going to be carrying into battle or possibly even into a tournament um, as a means of self-identification. But you still see that there becomes a distinct language for heraldry. Things like what colors can be used, what ways you can divide up your shields, what sorts of symbols, what sorts of um, animals might appear on your coat of arms. And then we slowly see other bits over the course of the Middle Ages be added to this. So you see helmets and crests appearing at the top. You might have animals on this either side or even people supporting the shield. You might have a personal motto. And so they grow in complexity. And um, we also see that there's a very well-defined hierarchy in terms of who's allowed to bear what emblem. And we are going to be discussing both what governs these rules, these highly esoteric, highly specific rules, and also what function it served. That brings us on, I think, to the first important thing to sort of distinguish, which is who gets coats of arms? Because, of course, you know, me and Olivia had a lot of fun designing each other's coats of arms, and these are things that we're going to treasure, I think, <laughs> for a long time. But we would not have had personal heraldry that anybody would have recognized or, um, or sort of recorded, because we are normal people. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Podcasters do not get heraldry. <laughs> but we deserve it. E-girls do. Like, famous e-girls probably It's a should. noble profession, podcasting. Is, yeah. My father was a podcaster, like his father before him. That used to just be called the radio. He worked in the pod mines, <laughs> mining up hot tapes. Mining Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mining clips for YouTube compilations. <laughs> Yeah, because um, the origins exactly of what it was that made this language of symbols trans or transition into a more formalized language of heraldry is a bit murky. There's not really one agreed reason or way this happened. I have some theories, but we'll get into that. But there is certainly, it is pretty clear, certainly, by the time that heraldry becomes more formalized, there are specific people who are being, um, who are bearing arms. Yeah, so I mean, the, the first obvious one is the nobility. Mm -hmm. um, so a, every great sort of landowning family would have a coat of arms that would be emblazoned on all their stuff. And that, I mean, that's, that's what we imagine when we think of arms, I think, is a bunch of knights riding into battle with all their sort of colorful, colorful gear. But it wasn't just the nobility um, who got to have coats of arms. Bishops and other prelates would have their own arms. Cities 
or boroughs would each have their own arms that would be emblazoned on the sort of on city buildings or on sort of on the city seal that was used to sort of sign declarations of the city government. And of course, you would have guilds um, who would have their own coats of arms. I love guild coat of arms because they are so tremendously, wonderfully literal. So long-time listeners will remember um, the Arte de la Lana of Florence, the wool, the, the all-powerful oligarchic wool guild that ran the Florentine government. Now their symbol, do you know it? I don't, actually. It's literally just a sheep carrying a flag. Yes. Um, but we also have a lot of similarly wonderful uh, guild symbols from London, which was also a city that was sort of run by the guilds. Mm -hmm. In fact, it still is. Yeah, they're the guys that own the swans. Yeah, well, they're, they're also the guys who get to run the city government yeah. in the city of London. Absolutely. Just that one mile bit, though, not the whole region, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are not bowing down. We are not going home and... Um, having to vote for our local like winemakers guild representative, <laughs> much as it much as it pains me. Um, so, for example, the uh, worshipful company of grocers of London, who are still a livery company, who are still around, uh, their coat of arms has a bunch of cloves on it. Classic. I yeah, know. That's I know. Good. So the Skinners, they have ermine. Mm -hmm. on their on their coat of arms and the wine merchants you know what they have they have grapevines they have barrels, they have barrels. even better yeah, even course. even more like, direct <laughs> yeah excellent and i should say that so those are the main sort of actual people who had coats of arms but the, the medieval fascination with armory was such that they also loved to create coats of arms for entirely fictional people or people who would have never had historical characters who would have never had coats of arms. So Julius Caesar, they gave him a coat of arms. Yeah. King Arthur. King Arthur. One. Yeah. Whose French artists usually depicted his as being suspiciously similar to the coat of arms of France <laughs> for reasons that I'm sure are lost to time. <laughs> well, yeah, we've talked in a previous episode about anachronistic medieval historical artwork. And mm -hmm. I think you can definitely, you can very much read that sort of thing in the context of, you know, the general medieval tendency to update, shall we say, <laughs> historical figures, you know, to be like, well, Take of course, license, yeah. of course, if we're going to write about Julius Caesar, we need to make him just like us. Yeah. So of course he needs a coat of arms. It's a pretty snazzy coat of arms, actually. Really? What does his look like, actually? Eagle. Oh, yeah. Oh, which is, which eagle. is pretty, which is surprisingly, I'd say, respectful of history <laughs> for medieval <laughs> yeah. artists. So we're going to get later on a bit more into why exactly this incredibly elaborate, somewhat arbitrary system came about. Extraordinarily arbitrary. Oh, yeah. But I think in order to do that, we need to give you guys a much better sense of of exactly how complex and arbitrary these rules are, which, mind you, we will just be scratching the surface. Oh, my God. it's It was painful because it goes it. so much deeper i mean there's entire dictionaries just filled with all these different terms um but yeah so this is the part where you should be getting out your pen and paper as well and start, start drawing up start taking notes start because drawing if you get it, it wrong they will you will go to court exactly so let's talk a bit about what comprises a coat of arms or rather a heraldic achievement i should say the central part of the coat of arms, and actually the only part that's broadly considered to be required, at least in England and I think generally internationally as well, is the coat of arms itself, the shield with different symbols on it. So everything else is sort of optional and can be assigned based on either local custom or on um, the rank or the status or the background of the recipient of the arms. So for instance, in England, only people of a specific rank are allowed to be granted supporters, the animals or creatures or people that hold up your shield, but everyone gets, at the very least, the shield itself. So um, let's talk a bit about that. Yeah, so this is actually, you get quite a bit of creative liberty in this, um, in your shield. It's basically a blank slate and you kind of just get to slap different symbols <laughs> and different sort of divisions on it um, as much as you want. So there are, um, Different types of shields. The shield is also referred to 
technically speaking as the escutcheon. Um, this will be the first of many highly specific <laughs> words derived from French that are used to but refer to But we will be heraldry. referring to it as shield we because will be, we will yes. not be hurting the audience's brains. Exactly. And um, in the Middle Ages, this was most traditionally, and most usually, uh, sort of almost triangular shield called a heater that was the most commonly used type of shield. Later on, after the Middle Ages, you see people slowly depart from this, especially as people stop using shields in general, uh, and the shapes become fancy and a bit unrealistic. But in the Middle Ages, you would be, you would want the, the heater. Because you got to put it on, on your shield. Exactly. I think this is a good time to mention that rules of heraldry, although they seem extremely arbitrary, they're often ha they often have some very tenuous link to reality as well, even though it doesn't necessarily have any bearing on real life. So one of these is that women aren't allowed to use shields in their heraldic achievements because, of course, women don't go on the battlefield and do battle. So it wouldn't be proper as a woman to have a shield. So women get something called a lozenge, which is a fancy <laughs> way of saying a diamond. <laughs> Here, have this soother. Literally, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's <laughs> usually it an that. oval or a diamond, or sometimes it's a slightly fancier shape, but it's a shape that's made exactly to look unshield like. What's the most feminine shape we can think of? Oof. Two mountains. <laughs> cut that. Um, <laughs> I will cut that. And it should also be, I think, mentioned before we go on that you're also limited in what sorts of colors you're allowed to use. Yes, well, there are there are the regular s colors, and then there are the uh, the metals, and you can't mix and match them um, willy nilly. Yeah, so they all have um, French names. Oh God! I actually read. I've struggled to find translate English translations of medieval heraldic treatises online. You'd think that would be there'd be such a demand for them. I did find one, which was a Welsh one actually, and oh. it was written by a guy named John Trevor, and he actually ranks all of the colors in order of nobility. How noble okay, he considers okay, okay, the okay. colors. Hit to me, be. and I'm going to tell you if I agree with John Trevor. You're going to give me the colors, and I'm going to give you a t my tier list. Of the heraldry colors. Okay, so yeah, we've got... Um, up top, we've got white slash silver. So technically, white doesn't exist in heraldry, only silver, which is a metal, but it's often represented by the color white. Mid, it's too cold, not very interesting. Fair enough. To John Trevor, this is the, the noblest one. Um, so next, John actually acknowledges that this is a bit of a hot take in heraldic circles, <laughs> but he says the second most noble color is black. You know what? I'm I'm kind of with him on that. I think... Where do you rank black? I think black is goaded. I think black and... Black and metal is a classic combination. Just like... I used to be a Warhammer guy, mm -hmm. so color combinations are very are very much something I care about. And black and, black and gold, for example... My God. Well, yeah, yeah. John Trevor acknowledges that other people who are involved or engaged in heraldry don't like black, and they think it's, you know, in line with the medieval good evil black white dichotomy. They think that black is a bad color, and it's That's a, a very black and white point of view. <laughs> um, <laughs> but John, John basically says, "Well, I don't think that you can really make a nice coat of arms without using a bit of black. Like black and white look good together." So he's right. You know, it's good to have a theory. bit of contrast, which is a very measured point of view. So I appreciate that. And also, it's like, screw you. Who like one of the most iconic like chivalric knights is the black. It's called the Black Prince. Yeah, exactly. Hypocrites. So next um, on the list, we have blue. Now I quite like blue. I think blue is good. Blue is good. Okay. Blue is good. I like blue. Yeah. So. Blue was also, I think, a bit of a controversial color. It's people's perspective on, like, blue, good or bad, changed a little bit throughout the Middle Ages. Well, there was the Blue Revolution, when everybody decided blue was cool. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of religious authorities sort of frowned on the color blue, because um, the Latin name for it, um, Latin name for blue, was related to celare, or to hide. So it's like, why are you using blue? Are you trying to hide something? <laughs> Very oh, literal excellent. people, um, medieval people. I, I, I have a lot of affection for that, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But over the sort of, up, up into the 12th century, um, 
blue kind of comes back into fashion and it's like this is actually noble and good which is why you see it in the um in the french coat of arms and in the in the traditional sort of arthurian coat as well so next up we have yellow slash gold like white and silver this is kind of a blurry line between the two of them technically it's gold not yellow but when it's rendered on a piece of paper, it often appears as yellow. So that's to John, the fourth most noble one. I'm going to say good. I kind of agree with him. Okay. I think it's, I think it's like, it's about how you use it. Like blue and gold, it's pretty good. Definitely, yeah. So next we've got red. Goated. Yeah, I think he put red way too far down. I have been, well, red is sort of, the connotations of red are sort of like, it's about passion. It's about charity and romance and sex it's just a workhorse isn't it <laughs> a lot of like I, I like charity and i like passionate things i, I like fruit <laughs> i'm a big fan of apples yeah no definitely what does he definitely. got what has john got against apples um he, i think i think his main and also of... isn't the sort of isn't the symbol of wales since the time of geoffrey of monmouth a goddamn red dragon yeah, this is maybe he was a self hating Welshman. I don't know. Um, but but yeah, I think his main he doesn't have anything. He doesn't really have anything bad to say about red, but he seems to just think black and white those are like fundamental, and then blue and gold are like just so good that they have to be at the top. Nerd. The only color he has anything negative to say about is the last one on our list, which is green. Hmm. I'm gonna say mid. I hate to say it, but I kind of agree with you, yeah. And I actually love green, but I just am not about heraldic. I don't know. I've just covered your coat of arms in green. Yeah, I was this about to say. This is gonna sound really insulting. Um, no, no, it's not. I'm that... gonna give you a crap color. I hate, I hate you, and I hate this color. No, so you're no, perfect I think for I each like other. the, I like the connotations of green, and I like green when it's used sparingly. But I think it's um, you know, it's no red. There's one color which he doesn't even include on the list, actually, mm -hmm. which is purple. Well, that's... You, you can't have purple. And that's because you can't have purple. It's illegal. It's the imperial color. Exactly. Like, so. that's just... That's just standard. So don't even think about it. Don't even try. Purple. Yeah, we can't even rank purple, you know? <laughs> it's uh, its its own thing. So... Um, so that's... Those are, those are the sort of cultural connotations of colors. I think it's time that we got into why we included... Uh, the colors that we did in each other's coat of arms. So I got to ask you, why did you choose green and white? Do you hate me? No, I chose green and white. I'll go into this more uh, as we get into the symbols as well. But because you're a flower child, it felt <laughs> like it was important to draw out your connection with nature. It's true. Sometimes I just like to go into... Look, every couple of weeks, I need to go into a forest and talk to nobody and look at some birds... And then I come out again, and I'm recharged. You've seen it. I have. You've seen what I'm like before I go in, and I how have. I am when I come out. Sometimes you look at deer as well. <laughs> whenever, whenever possible, I'm yes. looking at deer. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was the main thing, and then I chose the sort of sparing amounts of red and yellow to complement the green. But the green Excellent felt choice. like yeah, the right choice for you. So I want you to tell me um, why you think I chose those colors for your coat of arms. Specifically the red... Specifically on the, the shield. The red, white, and black. The red, white, and black. Um, You're going to kick yourself. Are those the Prussian colors? They're the Berlin colors. Oh, they are. So they, yeah, yeah, but they are the Prussian colors because, of course, you are a proud Berliner. Yeah, ich bin ein Berliner. You're wearing all black at the moment to sort of represent exactly. your people. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and there's also an animal on there, but we'll get into animals later. We'll get into animals very soon. Um, yeah. Okay, so so... And on both of our shields, we've commented, we have different kind of stripes and divisions. So mine has a diagonal white line that goes from the top left to the bottom right. Yours has this sort of chevron coming up from the yeah, bottom. Yeah, a black. chevron that divides the four, um, the four quadrants. Exactly. That's the next thing. Once you've chosen your shield and maybe your background color, that's the next thing you want to be thinking about is the shapes and the symbols you're going to put on it. So these basic divisions on shields are called ordinaries, and you've got all sorts of them. I've actually just printed out an image of a bunch of them because it's, you know, 
hard to it's describe. It's too confusing. I highly recommend just Googling heraldic ordinaries when you want to choose yours because it's all a bit arbitrary. So some of them have specific meanings, like you've got the saltire, which of course is Scotland! favored in Scotland. Freedom! Oh yes. Um, and then you've got... God, look at those spikes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then a lot of the other ones, I mean, you've got the fess, which is a horizontal stripe, and the pale, which is a vertical stripe, the bend, which is the diagonal stripe, and so on. And a lot of the time, it does come down to aesthetics. And... Well, there's one, I'd say, with one sort of asterisk around that, which is the cross. Oh, yes. Which has, obviously, a very specific meaning in Christianity. Yes, it Jebus. does. It does. So if you put a cross on your coat of arms, you are saying that you are a godly man. Exactly. Or woman. Yeah, and and these um, different ordinaries also give you a great way to divide up your shield because they give you spaces to put different symbols and sections on it. And let's maybe get into talking about those different symbols that you might have on your shield. So symbols, and particularly animal symbols, like colors, they all have their own different connotations and meanings, and these can vary based on time and place. But there are some general um, sort of trends, and also John Trevor in this treatise that I read has specific thoughts and feelings about what a lot of these different animals mean. I so he does. we have animals, and then we have more inanimate symbols. Basically, these could be assigned based on some sort of um, parallels that people perceived between the symbols and the the bearers um, based on either the connotations so you know for instance lions are of course a symbol of nobility traditionally so often you see lions on the coats of arms of monarchs and you often have eagles on the coats of arms of people who are um emperors within, yeah emperors yeah. especially within the holy roman empire or the real roman empire yes absolutely and there's another trend as well which i quite enjoy which is that symbols can also be assigned based on someone's name <gasps> so for instance i was looking through a german manuscript of different arms and, for instance, the family Erlenwein, Wein is, of course, German for wine. They have grapevines. There's a family called Zonborn. Zona is German for sun, so they have a sun on theirs. I really enjoyed that there was a family called Crevette, which is French for prawn, so they have a prawn on theirs. Ah. Uh. Which is great. You have... That's um, brilliant. I, I want to have a prawn. Oh, I know. I should have put a prawn on yours because you're happy just being a prawn. I'm happy just being a prawn. Shout out super organism. Um, in French, the word for hedgehog is Arison. <gasps> so people with the surname Harris or Harrison usually have hedgehogs on their oh, coats of yes. arms. yes. Well, you know why... I should say this. You know why the sheep on your on your coat of arms is black? Why is that? Zvartout. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. It makes perfect sense. So, yeah, there were also a lot of cases of minstrels assuming arms um, or heraldry, and these led to some funny symbols because often minstrels could choose stage names. So there was a guy I was looking at who was named Heinrich um, von Meissen properly, but his stage name was Heinrich Frauenlob, which means Heinrich Praise of Ladies. And so his <laughs> arms <laughs> depict a lady. Nice. His so what you're saying woman. So what you're saying is if Brian Butterfield had a coat of arms <laughs> it would be like a cow probably yeah or a butter ch or a butter churning thing. Yeah. What do you call those? Uh just a churn. A churn. Yeah. One other one I enjoyed from the Middle Ages there was a family called the Colleoni family which in Italian is the orig the exact origins of the name are unclear it either means hill of lions or it means testicles. <laughs> Both of them are pronounced essentially the same way, and the guy who first bore arms for this family chose to go for the latter, so his coat of arms has three pairs of testicles on it. Charming. Um, which I enjoyed. Charming. And also that one of the members of the family in the 15th century had a war cry that was kolia, 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 which just means balls, balls, balls. <laughs> he, so he's charging into battle with his testicle shield. Screaming testicles, testicles, testicles. I think if I was charging into a medieval battle, I would also be screaming balls, balls, yeah. balls, but in a very different tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Oh god, oh no, oh god, oh god, balls, 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 oh god, no. oh no, oh god, oh Absolutely. no, no god, oh no, god, oh no. 
<laughs> Sorry, I had to make that go on a little bit too. I know, it's very Stuart Lee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there are also some modern examples of uh, this phenomenon I wanted to pick out. So, George Martin has his own coat of arms. What? I didn't know this. What? He does. The, Sorry, what? The producer of the Beatles. Um <gasps> Now I want to. Now I want to go away and design coats of arms for all the Beatles. <laughs> they all have their coat of their coats of arms already. Do they? Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. We're coming back to that after this episode is yeah. recorded. Wait. Okay. No. Hang on. What's on Ringo's? I don't remember. I just remember. I just remember looking at George Martin's because he has. Um, on his shield, he has three beetles, which I enjoyed. Three stag beetles. I don't know why they didn't give him four. Okay, Ringo's coat of arms. This is fairly disappointing, actually. It's quite normal. I remember looking at all of the beetles, individual ones, and not being that impressed. But I really like that George Martin has the actual beetles on his coat of arms. And he also has a bird called a house martin. That's really good. So. Paul McCartney's got a guitar. Yeah, In that fact, one's not... He's his, got like a... The yeah. shield has like the... The sort of innards of a guitar on it. That one's pretty good. Yeah. Ringo's does not have the drooms on yeah, it. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> is Ringo already sure? <laughs> Anyways. Oh, and there's one more which I wanted to bring up, which is that there's a village called Hensbrook in um, the Netherlands. Hen means hen, of course, and brook can means mean... Means brook. Can mean brook. <laughs> and that is indeed the origin of the word of the name Hensbrook, but the word can also mean breeches, as in a pair of trousers. And so the coat of arms since 1871 for the village of Hensbrook is a chicken wearing a pair of trousers. Yes! Yeah. Gotta love the Dutch. But, um, apart from that, of course, as I said, there are specific symbolisms you can get into with each animal. And not only that, but there's also specific words for the pose that each animal has, which I really love. And so these go on and on. I won't go through all of them. Well, if it's rearing up and going, for those, for those at home who can't visualize this, I went, I just went like this. <laughs> That's called rampant. That's called rampant. You also have seatant, which is sitting, statant, which is standing up. <laughs> Um, Eatin't, which is eating. You have couchant, which is lying down. <laughs> On a couch. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then, of course, there's specific poses for, you know, birds, if they have their wings outstretched. There's specific poses that can only be assumed by uh, mammal-bird hybrids like griffins, um, because they involve some assortment of arm and wing positions. And so, yeah, there's a whole terminology around this. So your shield... Has a sheep on it. Do you know why? Is it because I love wool? It is because you love wool and weaving. And I'm always... her. For those of you at home, her house is full of, like, detritus, but mostly wool-based detritus. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm always, like, getting tangled in things and oh, tripping yeah. over things. It's a, it's a biohazard. It's like someone exploded a sheep. <laughs> so, yeah, you... The funnier version of a joke I told four months ago. <laughs> So you've got four symbols on yours. I'll go through all of them. So you do have one animal, which is the horse. Yeah. So the horse is actually not just a horse. It's a mare. Oh. I chose the mare because the Latin word for ocean is mare, or for sea, rather, is mare. Oh. And um, I chose that as a sort of pun to allude to your love of Mediterranean culture and specifically beautiful Mediterranean women. I hate you so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can't put me on blast like that. <laughs> I thought it was pretty clever, though. However, do DM me. <laughs> um, and then on the other side of that, we have a Warhammer, which is meant to symbolize your love of Warhammer 40k. Yes, and I would say that whole genre. As yes, well. definitely. I'd I'd say that it my love of science fiction. Shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, on top, we have. Uh, as you say, a wreath of flowers and a pint of beer. Would you like to hazard a guess what those mean? I think I guess what the pint of beer is. What? Well, um, it's the fact that you tend to find me at the pub. No, it's not. Oh, what is it not? Mean? So this is, I was looking up actually what uh, the second part of your surname means. I don't know if you know what tape means. For those of you at home, one half of my surname is tape, which is a... Uh, Francisized version 
of a German surname. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? Well, yeah, so Tappe uh, was a German surname in origin, and it means, um, basically comes from the word tap, so it's like tavern keeper. <gasps> I come from a long line of, pu of German pub landlords. The best kind of lineage. Prussian, <laughs> Prussian bar owners. <laughs> <laughs> Drink your beer and get out of my pub. <laughs> <laughs> so the entire top half above the chevron of your coat of arms is a pun on your name because I wanted to include a crown for prince, but uh -huh. because you're a flower child, I thought make it a flower crown. Nice. So yeah, the top That's part brilliant. is about your, your name and the bottom part is about your interests. That's fantastic. That's slightly more thought than I put into it. I, I definitely devoted too much time to this. I I had a thought when I was sort of doing the second the second coat of paint on mm -hmm. yours and I thought she's either going to really dig this or get a restraining order. No, I love it. <laughs> I sure. really love it. <laughs> so yeah, let's get into what sorts of animals and symbols you might choose for your coat of arms. Yes. So the most obvious one is the lion. Um this is really vanilla, so I will judge you if you choose a lion unless your name is like Leon, or you have some sort of really specific lion connection. Because um, Olivia's a massive snob. I am a massive snob, and I am not like other girls. She's from Berlin, all right? I you am from to, Berlin. She's recovering. Yes. Um, but yeah, so lions, of course, as you may already be aware, often symbolize bravery, nobility, leadership, power, etc. Um, and Ingerland. And Ingerland. And soon we're going to do an episode about bestiaries and specific medieval attitudes towards animals but in the meantime this is going to be kind of a little taster because this is a discussion of um a few different animal symbolisms in the middle ages so we people who have people who have bought olivia's delightful book uh weird medieval guys how to live laugh love and die in dark times yes uh will know all of this exactly so just tune this out if you have <laughs> um so next we've got leopards leopards and heraldry aren't really represented that differently to lions um well because it's just a skinny lion that somebody's thrown paint at basically yeah i don't really get medieval attitudes towards leopards because there's a medieval conception that the leopard is a hybrid between two animals called a lion and a pard hence the name leopard and i have read that when medieval people wrote about leopards they were referring to cheetahs but i've also sort of seen some sources where this isn't corroborated but anyways there's this idea that leopards are hybrid creatures and so um, John Trevor specifically says that you can bear a leopard on your coat of arms to indicate that you're a bastard. <laughs> or rather, because your arms are probably, for most of the Middle Ages, afterwards being assigned by a specific armorial authority, they would give you a leopard to tell the world that you're a bastard. Now, just to be clear, by bastard, we mean... Someone born out of wedlock. Yes, not, not like somebody who's guy. mean. Yeah, exactly. Um, and he also notes that abbots can use leopards as their personal symbols because usually hybrid creatures are sterile and high-ranking members of the church are not supposed to have sex. And they famously never do. Exactly. So up next we've got the stag. Obviously medieval people think stags are very noble and princely and you've got lots of positive stag association. And one thing that John Trevor mentions is that the stag's antlers fall off every year and then regrow larger the next year. And so he says that stags are a great symbol for people who were born into poverty and then accrued wealth. So people who are on the kind of, you know, hustle mindset, billionaire grind set culture. That's pretty cool. Like, I kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you joke, but like social mobility is not something that's necessarily portrayed super positively in a lot of medieval culture. Yeah. So having something that's both associated with a positive thing and with, you know, rising out of poverty. Yeah, 100%. It's quite unusually positive. So we've got the boar. Boar represent envy um, in medieval symbolism and medieval animal culture. And also sometimes the devil. And sometimes the devil. So you might be given a boar if you are someone who is particularly known as being envious or diabolical. Guilty. <laughs> but uh, Trevor also notes that boars are hunted by propping up a spear and allowing the boar to run at the spear and impale itself on it, which might not seem like a positive attribute in a creature, but he says this makes a boar an apt 
a symbol for someone who's a really noble fighter who'd rather die than run from battle. A vigorous and uh, tough-to-kill guy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've got some kind of basic ones. You've got the bear usually represents strength. Um, There's a lot of great medieval bear facts, but I'm going to save them for episode (laughs) on animals because I just, I can't make it that easy for you guys. Dogs are pretty common on coats of arms, especially greyhounds and other kinds of hunting hounds. So those are really loyal animals, and they represent someone who's loyal. Um, Have you ever met a greyhound? Yeah, they're you know how they magnanimous. They are. You know how they they're show non-plus. like affection. Um, I mean, Daniel's parents is greyhound. Just kind of, I don't know. He doesn't. They lean against you gently. Yeah, yeah they're very. Uh, they're understated. But he also mentions that greyhounds are and dogs are particularly good as symbols of loyalty because they might represent that someone will just do whatever their master tells them unthinkingly, even charging into a situation that will end their life. Which, believe it or not, in the Middle Ages is a positive <laughs> so <that's> attribute. Great. <laughs> so yeah, eagles usually used um, for people who have a connection to Rome, especially the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so if you're from the Mediterranean, um, you have some Italian ancestry, get that eagle in there. And also call me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And give Aaron a call. Then we've got dragons. Dragons are one of those creatures that, uh, a bit like the boar, are have negative connotations in medieval literature, but also people clearly think they're like a bit cool. Dragons are really ambiguous. I've mm-hmm. been pushing you to do an episode about dragons for months. Yeah. We'll get around to it eventually, but they can mean a vast array of things. They can be associated with Satan, but also especially in like Wales and uh and 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 Celtic British mythology, they also can just symbolize a great warrior. And dragons are also, especially in insular pre-Norman invasion artwork, dragons are used really decoratively. And even a bit afterwards, you see them used very decoratively in medieval manuscripts and medieval art, because you have these really long serpentine dragons that are contorting themselves into different shapes, like big letters and stuff. There is a kind of aesthetic fascination with the dragon in the Middle Ages, so... John Trevor says that dragons are particularly good for people who are strong, mighty, fierce, and especially eager for battle. Someone mm. who's always raring for a fight might uh, be given a dragon. So that mad guy down the pub. Exactly. <laughs> um, so you've got hawks in heraldry as well. John Trevor notes that hawks are thought of as cunning and courageous, even though they're comparatively small birds of prey. And so he says that they're very good symbols for people who are physically weak or small, but very clever and brave. <laughs> Virgins. <laughs> so I like that we've got an animal for the short king. <laughs> <laughs> so owls are for people who are lazy and cowardly. What? Yeah, I know. Pe- medieval people did not like owls because they thought owls were like Jews. Or maybe that Jews were like owls. I don't know which. Are you like an owl? A little bit. I'm a Either hoot. You have I'm a owl- hoot. <laughs> I hate you. Um, I mean, you're sort of scholarly and you like... I can turn my head all the way around. You want to see? No. <laughs> I was going to say scholarly and nocturnal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's man. <laughs> um... As, yeah, we've got doves as well. Um, so because doves are seen as gentle and kind birds and because they have been domesticated and often congregate around places where people live, um, John Trevor says that they're great symbols for people who are harmless and kind and particularly people who have faith in their companions. And we've got swans for people who are attractive, a long necked, or very good at singing. And why wasn't I given a swan? <laughs> Oh, for reasons that not, become clear. Am I not hot enough to be a swan? There were better options. Um, oh, no, you are. You'd knock it out of the park. And then last of all in my list, we have crabs. Would you like to guess what a crab is good for? Eaten. Crabs are for if you are bow-legged or otherwise walk funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of... That, that That is funny, but also I find that... I also find that kind of charming. Yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, these are just John Trevor's list. There's doubtless um, other people who have written down different opinions. And of course, as I've tried to express, it was all a bit malleable. It might also be based on where you're from, 
you know. Well, all these connotations are regional. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this was a Welsh guy talking. There are different connotations all over the place, some of which are quite apocryphal. Um, and there's all sorts of weird emblems that we don't really know where they came from. There was one I quite enjoyed. It's called the Enfield Beast. That's on the coat of arms of the city of Enfield, although perhaps the name Enfield is actually from a different etymology and it's just kind of a convergent evolution. But it's a creature with like the head of a fox, the paws of a lion, like the tail of a cat. It's just kind of a mishmash cut and paste. I met one of those last Saturday night. (laughs) At Weatherspoon. (laughs) Exactly. Um... Yeah, no, you gotta watch out for those Enfield beasts. They come into London on the weekends. They prowl the streets (laughs) for their prey. Um, Public transport is just too good. No, exactly. And then um, you've got, again, as I mentioned before, your inanimate symbols. And these are basically, like animals, pretty much endless. So, as I've said, you might have testicles on yours. Um, Keys are very popular as symbols of um, sort of sovereignty. You've got on the British coat of arms a harp to represent Ireland, so you have lots of national symbols. Mm. Um, You've got, uh, let's see, there's an apocryphal one that I enjoy that's a village in Poland that has a shoe as theirs. Hell Um, yeah. I read that it was a trend during... In, in Eastern Europe, uh, during wars against the Ottoman Empire, a uh, severed Turk's head oh, yeah, impaled absolutely. on a sword was widely used as a symbol, which is cool. Cool beans. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Maybe might want to get on changing that. Yeah, maybe not cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you've basically got, you know, if you can, if you can name it, um, you can put it on a coat of arms. So, once you've chosen your amalgamation of different symbols and animals and geometric divisions and your shape of your shield, that's all you need. But, you know, don't you want a bit more? There's other have some bits fun. you can add on. And so, another element that you commonly see on a coat of arms, or on a heraldic achievement, rather, is a helm with a crest. Um, and so you might have a helmet at the top of your shield with a crest upon it. And the helmet is pretty basic. It's basically just a helmet. You might sometimes have a crown instead. And then you might have a crest atop that, which arises from the tradition of helmets, in particular jousting helmets and tournament helmets, but also war helmets, having crests atop them for identification. So especially because coats of arms are very hereditary, this might be a space for a more personal symbol, like how George Martin was given the House Martin. <laughs> um, I was reading about... Here's a, a trivia question for you. <gasps> I love those. Can you guess who the most recent U.S. president was to have their own coat of arms? Okay. Um, it really does sound like a thing that Trump would do, but that sounds too obvious. So I should mention that in order as a U.S. citizen to be granted a coat of arms, the U.S. doesn't have an arms granting no, authority. So because they it's a need, goddamn revolutionary republic. They need to be given their arms by someone, a different an overseas authority. This is probably wrong, but I'd like to explain my, my rationale. Go on. I think it's JFK because Kennedys are Catholic, so they have a connection to uh, the Holy See, so they have an international connection. And their sort of seat of power in Massachusetts was referred to as... I don't actually know. Camelot. Yeah, I they really that. leaned into the Arthurian stuff. Oh, that's fun. So that's my guess. It's JFK. Okay, JFK did have his own coat of arms. Yes! But two U.S. presidents since then have also had coats of arms. Oh, God. After Kennedy, Reagan, and more recently, Bill Clinton. Oh, God. Of course it's Bill Clinton. Who Bill did he get? Clinton. Who did Bill Clinton get them from? Ireland. For his work in initiating peace oh, talks in Northern fa- Ireland. You know what? Fair enough, actually. <laughs> and um, he has a crest on his that. So he has a, a lion, which is adorned with red and white stripes uh, to give it the American link. But at the top, he has an anchor um, that has the word spes, which is S-P-E-S, which is Latin for hope, which indicates that he was born in a town in Arkansas called Hope. That's nice. This is a bit nice, yeah. So that's thank you, for, thank you for helping to save our country from yeah. decades of sectarian conflict and state violence. Oh, it's great, yeah. 
have a little crest. Yeah, it's it's very it's very Hibernian the whole mm. thing. It's got <laughs> some um, it's got some shamrocks on it. It's got a oh motto in Irish. Um, it's now great. that's cultural appropriation. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Thank All right, right, so let's talk about our helmets. So yeah, I've given you kind of an Ottoman style. Yes, I, I immediately recognize that helmet, which of course represents your love of Turkish culture and Constantinople. Yes, and Ottoman history. Yeah. And oh, there's yeah. a boat on top of it. Right. The boat represents your sort of itinerant globetrotting lifestyle <laughs> that you are, a, you know, transatlantic child. So yes. You have, you know, American, one American and one British parent. And so the ship represents, you know, your trans the Mayflower. transatlantic identity. But you'll note that That's it lovely. has its sails furled to represent that you are you settled down. That's very sweet. Thank you. Mine is much simpler. <laughs> You've got a crown. Yeah, because this would be this was because that would have been harder to paint. Yeah, um, valid. Well, I didn't want to give you a helm mm -hmm. because it felt inappropriate. Women aren't supposed to yeah, have helms. exactly. So I was like, what's the next best thing? And so I gave you a, a very basic uh, crown. Uh, not a not an imperial crown with anything sort of... This looks top. like the Edinburgh crown, kind of. It is a bit like the Edinburgh crown, but my rationale is just... Because you're a queen. Aww. <laughs> King. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that is... that That's... That's crowns. Yes, there's basically free reign on that one. Um, just choose whatever crest you like. My favorite one that I found while researching is, I can't remember the name, but a Canadian astronaut. Or sorry, a, a Canadian astrophysicist, I think, who has a an astronaut's helmet as her helmet. Oh, so cool. I know. Yeah, I mean, once you get into the 20th century, it's almost cheating with heraldry because they just started putting everything, and especially <laughs> scientific heraldry, is really, really cool. And we won't get into it because it's not really on topic for medieval heraldry, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. Hell yeah. So up next, we have two other things, the supporters and the motto. So let's get into the supporters very quickly. The supporters yes. are simply two guys that hold up your shield. What kinds of guys? Well, anything. They can be animals and any sort of animal symbolism that we discussed already would apply here, so it's not necessarily a different uh, symbolic iconographic tradition, um, but it's just a way to pack in even more imagery and symbolism into yours. Although in um, British heraldry, and I think in other countries as well, although less so, only people of a certain rank can be given supporters. Boo. And so these might be animals. They might, I mean, I think um, Britain has a, a lion and a unicorn. Well, that represents. That represents England and Scotland. Well done. And I was reading about Margaret Thatcher's coat of arms. She has, I think, Isaac Newton as one of her supporters. Would not have seen that coming. She has, uh, she, I think, before her career in politics, pursued a scientific career. Fair enough. And her other supporter is um, a Navy captain to symbolize her victory in the Falklands. <laughs> cool. Gotta hand, gotta hand it to her, yeah. yeah Fair yeah, enough. Valid. Um, so you've given me Frog and Toad, I yes. think? Yes. These are deliberately ambiguous. Ambiguous amphibians. Yes. So Olivia has a long-standing love of frogs and toads. Not least the iconic frog and toad of uh, Arnold Lobel's, that's his name, right? Yeah, Arnold Lobel. Arnold Lobel's uh, beloved series, which we both have so a very, good. very deep affection for. I actually did a reading before the podcast yes. of one of his books. But they also just represent your love of your love of amphibians, but also our shared love of frog and toad. Yeah, we do love frog and toad. Yeah. No, they, they're gorgeous. You couldn't have chosen anything more apt. As soon as I saw the different colors, I knew that was frog and toad. <laughs> And what about me? So I've got a I've got an elephant and a crow? Yeah, so do you care to guess what either of these mean? I have absolutely no idea. So the elephant is there, this is specifically a white elephant, and it represents your love of Krabby's alcohol <laughs> <and your beer. laughs> which, which has an elephant on the You're label. really revealing a bit too much about me and my personal life. <laughs> and um the crow this was Daniel, my boyfriend's suggestion. We were sitting on the couch, like, what's the other animal that represents Aaron? I was gonna use a whale to further emphasize your transatlantic identity, but then I thought if there's a whale and an elephant, either one of them will drown or one of them will Yeah suffocate on land. So it felt unrealistic. So Daniel suggested the crow, 
because crows are very good at imitating human voices <laughs> and you are a master of impressions and character work. <laughs> so that's what the crow represents. That's very generous of you, <laughs> master. Um, so yeah, but the supporters can really be anything. They can be knights, they can be beautiful women like in Edinburgh. Yes, so my hometown of Edinburgh has a shield that has a castle on it, supported by a doe and a woman, or as I've written here in my notes, a baddie. Yeah. Um, so the doe represents St. Giles, who is, um, who is the uh, patron saint of Edinburgh. Uh, the woman, or the baddie, represents Edinburgh Castle, because Edinburgh Castle was referred to as the Castle of Maidens. Wait, it wasn't St. Giles, like, breastfed by a deer in the lore? According to some uh, accounts, yeah. It's... Uh. I don't know what deer milk tastes like. I'd rather not find out. Me neither. Um, and the castle represents... Edinburgh Castle. A castle. That's yeah. what I thought. Very yeah. literal. Exactly. Or to take another city coat of arms, the city of London, uh, you have the Cross of St. George, supported by two dragons, which is, you know, represents the, the fact that London is the capital of England, <laughs> and St. George is the patron saint of England. And, but you also have a red upright cross in the shield, which is the symbol of the martyrdom of St. Paul. And St. Paul is the saint which the, which the cathedral of the city of London, St. Paul's Cathedral, is dedicated to. There you go. So yeah, people have gotten uh, creative with these. Sometimes some coat of arms have included inanimate objects as supporters, which is quite fun. So I think one of the most famous ones is the flag of Spain, which has two columns, one on either side. Uh, and those are, technically speaking, the supporters. Um, and um, the coat of arms of Valencia uses the letter L on either side. I love the coat of arms of Valencia. Yeah, it's the bat. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a bat. Love the bat. Um, and a ribbon. Oh, it's super fun. Um, and then I think there's a, let me see, let me find it. Um, you do actually have whales in, um, as in the animals in a, there's a Dutch one that has that. Um, and then, oh, let me find it. There's I think a there's really a good fucking one. kick-ass Canadian one. There's a county actually. in Northern Ireland that has badgers, which I love. Um, yes. Malaysia has tigers. So this is not medieval, but I just love it so much anyway. The coat of arms of Nunavut, which is a territory in Canada, um, has two supporters, which are a reindeer and a narwhal. Yes. Check it out. Oh, those guys are cool. They're so cute. I really like them. Uh, which represents the fact that Nunavut is like, you know, it's an Arctic territory and they've got all kinds of weird animals up there. Yeah, they do. Um, Shout out to Nunavut. Yes. If anyone is listening from Nunavut, like phone in. Please. Tell us how you feel. If anyone is listening from Nunavut or the Northwest Territories or the Yukon, <laughs> please do write below in the comments because I'd love to hear about that. No, 100%. Um, and I think I even saw that there were missiles used as supporters on a coat of arms for a U.S. like military group. But I forget which one. Um, but let's move on to our last sort of fundamental element of heraldry. <laughs> Um, and this is the motto. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot to say about the motto. Um, mostly you have free reign. I mean, it should be something that fits pretty succinctly on your coat of arms. It can be in any language that you want. Um, so Latin is sometimes seen as the traditional language, but English is used and every other language basically under the sun is used. Um, but it should be a short snappy sort of saying that represents your philosophy or your, if you're an organization maybe your goals and your aims so your motto on your coat of arms is mine is ain't that just the way from over the garden <laughs> wall which i absolutely love it's a tv show that you love but also i think it does speak to your sort of just My lifestyle philosophy. yeah absolutely <laughs> And uh, what have you got on yours? So I've got a Latin phrase, mm -hmm. which is uh, tempora aptari deset, which yes. means... Times should be adapted to. Well, I wanted to choose something that included uh, a variation on the Latin word, um, aptus, which means to sort of develop or evolve or conform. Because um, my initials because are APT. Because your initials are APT. Yeah. So it means times should be adapted to, but it also means times should be Aaron Prince Tapade too. Yes! <laughs> That's yes. really the only meaning. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. brilliant. So yeah, you can give yourself a, a motto that speaks to 
speaks to you, but yes. it better be pithy. You can't have like a whole thing. Margaret Thatcher's was like cherish liberty or something. Of so course it is, yeah. Don't use that. Um, <laughs> please. Never in danger. So. So. We've just had a marvelous journey through different elements of heraldic achievement. And some of the different symbols um, that you might use, the meanings behind those. So, um, right. It's so, basically a flat line. Flatlining. So we've just had a fascinating journey through the world of heraldic achievement, in particular in the Middle Ages, and some of the symbols and you might use and their meanings. Um, so we've really barely, I think, scratched the surface of just how complex this gets. I mean, on this... Um, a sheet of ordinaries that I've printed out. I think there's um, there's 18 of them, different ways that you can put stripes on a shield. There's two bars, there's bendlets, there's uh, a pile, there's chevronelles, and of course we've got the different words for the colors and for the positions of the animals, and we've got different types of fur that can be stylistically represented, and it just goes on and on, and there's different rules governing who's allowed to have each symbol and each element and how everything should be put together. And I think, you know, these sort of systems of niche arbitrary rules are fascinating because they give us a little insight into the culture that gave birth to them. So. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah, there's like, there's so many different combinations. I think there is estimated to have been about a, th a million coats of arms in use over the course of the Middle Ages. I mean, the way that I like to explain it is that it's a little bit like going, designing a coat of arms is a little bit like going to Burger King. <laughs> There's like a hundred thousand possible combinations, um, but you're really just, you're going to get the same ingredients wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're like a member of the titled aristocracy, they give you something special. Yes, the, the secret Burger King that, <laughs> that only exists for the, for the nobility. Yeah. They let you put vegetables on it. Oh, Mrs. Thatcher. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Would you like to sample our exclusive, um, conservative burger? <laughs> Another thing to note is that it was vitally important that two people did not have the same coat of arms. Yeah, because in the beginning of this armorial tradition, you were basically choosing your own symbols. Yeah. And you could go around and bear whichever symbols you like, but with the limited number of different symbols and configurations that existed in early heraldry, this of course led to the sticky situation of some people sharing symbols. Which was not necessarily an issue, because in the Middle Ages you weren't necessarily going to meet all that many people. Oh yeah, John uh, Trevor actually mentions this. He says, if two people that live in different countries have the same symbols, it's fine. But if two, ple if, but if two people that are, say, both blacksmiths on the same street have the same symbols, that might cause some trouble. And this did cause trouble. So the most famous case of... Uh, a dispute over who owned a coat of arms comes from a famous um, 13th century case called Scrope v. Grosvenor, which was a case where two knights who were on campaign in Richard II's army during the Hundred Years' War, they went up to Scotland to go and do what um, English kings love to do in Scotland, which is burn down villages and then sort of mill about for a bit and then go home. Um, but while they were doing that, they did notice they were wearing the same outfit, which I think would have been tremendously awkward. So these two knights take each other to court to settle this. In 1385, King Richard II establishes basically a military court to settle this dispute once and for all. And the two knights basically argue their cases to, to present their evidence that their coat of arms went back to the first Norman conquests of 1066, which of course, as we've established, is... In retrospect, nonsense, because there were no consistent coats of arms being used in the Norman Conquest. But in any case, that was the arguments that each of them had to make. And so they each called on witnesses. There were a hundred witnesses called in total. Wow. Including some of the biggest names of 14th century England. So we have returning characters from Weird Medieval Guys episodes past, like Geoffrey Chaucer. We also have a little-known Welsh nobleman. Uh, by the name of Owain Glendower, who shows up uh, very briefly to give a deposition in favor of Grosvenor. 
and he, he comes in and he shows and he says that he'd seen some charters, uh, which from the look of the parchment were very old, <laughs> which means that it must have been um, Grosvenor who'd been using the crest first. So in the end, uh, the court ruled in favor of Scrope, and he was allowed to continue to use his coat of arms, and um, Grosvenor's had to adopt an entirely different symbol, but they kept the same color scheme because they had all yeah. they had all the, they had all their outfits planned already, you of know. Of course. Um, now, why am I talking about Scrope v. Grosvenor? Well, because I think that it speaks to the function that coats of arms had in the Middle Ages. Now, we've kind of alluded to them in the introduction in that you wear it into battle. But I think there's a lot more to unpack about why. Why you needed a personal symbol and why this. We have a, a great wealth of apocryphal stories of how coats of arms came to be. One of my absolute favorite ones is that according to, um, once again, John Trevor, this is very bad sourcing for me, but there's is genuinely so hard to find translated primary sources. So um, John Trevor alleges that apparently coats of arms, in particular all of these divisions, came about because they were originally marks left on shields from battle. Absolute horseshit. But I think it does allude to how these symbols are kind of tied into status yeah. and knightly achievement. Well, you say knightly achievement, and I think that's the right place to start, because these become associated with noble families. They're hereditary symbols as much as the, the land and the rights of a, of a family are hereditary. Now... Interestingly, the um, the emergence of coats of arms, as we understand them, coincides with a general trend, which I'm not going to get too much into here, but a general to a general trend towards the atomization of the family structure in medieval life, moving from these sort of large clans where both, you know, both your, your relative, really the relatives that matter are on both your mother and your father's side towards this much more slimmed down thing where you have a patrilineal um, na sort of name and house that, uh, that, that, that you belong to and sort of you trace yourself back along those lines. Now, when we say it's, it's very, that, that's something that people have sort of pieced together from mostly from like wills and other sort of personal, um, personal documents. But what does that actually mean in terms of personal identity? I think this is a really important point because let's be real. We probably don't, we probably can't trace our family history unless we're like one of those Americans who's obsessed with Ancestry.com. Only more than a couple of generations, right? Certainly only a couple of generations past people you would have known. Yes. And you might think that with the, that the Middle Ages, with their sort of obsession with, uh, you know, with, with hereditary titles and so on, would be a much, much more sort of preoccupied by that. And while you do see more genealogies being written that sort of trace much further back into history over the course of the Middle Ages, um, we also have a lot of primary sources that suggest that people would only actually know and remember and think about a couple of generations back, so like their grandparents and their great grandparents. Before that, it's like it's basically just something in a dusty book. It's something yeah. that you necessarily identify with. Mm -hmm. And I would contend. Here's my first con contention about Ooh. coats of arms: is that I think that they are a because the human brain can't really compute. Uh, you know, going back fifteen generations to like the Battle of Hastings or whatever. I think coats of arms are a way of creating a familial identity and a sense of personal identification with the with these long lineages that transcends what the human brain is sort of capable of. Because if you have a symbol that says, we are the Swarthouts, and this has been our symbol since time immemorial, and this is what we stand for, and that, you know, you put that on everything. You put that on tombs, you put that on cups, you put that on shields. That reifies this ideal this idealized family structure yeah and i think we've touched a little bit before on medieval traditions around terminology and around sort of systems of rules and how these were means of enforcing or um sort of you know proving nobility 
And I think this is very much part of that, that not only can you prove the sort of longevity and thus the legitimacy, because these two things are very intrinsically linked, not just in medieval culture, but I would argue in human culture for all of written memory. If you can prove we've been living here or doing this for a long period of time, that basically to a lot of people proves, well, we have the right to keep doing this, but also... Um, that these systems can prove that someone is noble because someone is able to, um, you know, engage with the right, um, you know, customs and the right traditions for creating and bearing um, and using a heraldic achievement. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that it legitimizes is property rights. And that can be everything from your ownership of a cup that has your family crest on it, to your ownership of a vast tract of land that earns you a stupendous amount of money. Um, so in a, in a society where power and ownership are passed down in a hereditary fashion and the, and the family that matters for that purpose is sort of the, the father's name, it makes sense that you would have systems to turn that into a sense of belonging. Absolutely. And there's especially an importance for the monarch, because after Scrope v. Grovener in England, and as the Middle Ages went on, there was a consolidation of power um, in who's able to regulate heraldry um, in the monarch, and the monarch was able to delegate that power to, um, you know, specially selected people who then were the people who had to approve any new coats of arms, and this is still how it is today. If you want to bear arms officially in the UK and many other countries, then you need to petition these people and then they will grant you your coat of arms and they will consult the roles and consult um, you know, your lineage and choose something that they feel is appropriate in keeping with heraldic tradition. And so the king is able, or the monarch is able to be uh, a regulator of this and to gatekeep this symbol of status. The symbol of status and to gatekeep property rights. Mm -hmm. I would also say that even though there was emphasis on patrilineal coats of arms in that most often women were bearing their husbands or their father's arms um, on a lozenge and weren't always granted their own coats of arms, um, at least not in the, to the same extent that men were, there was also a tradition of combining and smashing together different coats of arms. Uh, so the most common way to do this was something called impalement, which is less violent than it sounds. <laughs> it basically That's just means you split your coat of arms, your shield, in two, and you put one set on one side and you squish the other set into the other. And this was especially useful if you came from two very noble lineages on your mother's and your father's side, then you could lay claim to both of those by putting them both on your coat of arms. So you might be asking after that, say you marry someone who's also done the same thing, then what do you do? Well, you just do another impalement and combine them again. And so this went on and on. Um, and it was another kind of thing that peaked after the Middle Ages, but I think in the 17th or 18th century, this reached its height with people having hundreds, I think the record was around 700 different arms on their coat of arms. <sighs> see, at that point, just make a new one. I think so. But you see this as well in, for instance, um, this legitimization by combining different arms in the coat of arms of the United Kingdom, which yeah. has symbols from England and Scotland and Ireland. It has the Irish harp and the Scottish lion and the English lions as well, although it does not include any symbols of Wales. Which is not a coincidence, because England and Eng Scotland and Ireland were united with England um, through sort of, at least, at least officially, through sort of consensual and parliamentary means, and Wales was conquered militarily. Irish listeners who are about to... to um, to write in, I know perfectly well the terms on which Ireland joined the United Kingdom and what the and what the Irish state was yeah. in eighteen hundred. You do not need to lecture me. Yeah. I know it. I know it was apartheid. Yeah. But then my point is, you know, the idea is then that you look at this coat of arms and you say this is a symbol of unity and this legitimizes 
the union of all of these different nations by presenting them in this institutionalized form. Absolutely. And I think bringing up countries is an important tradition or is an important transition because it also, I also think that it's worth stressing that like we mentioned before, it's not just royal or noble families that have coats of arms. You also have boroughs and guilds and other sort of forms of association. Um, so why, you know, if, if, if this is all about property rights, why do they need arms? Well, first of all, because they, organizations can own property as well. But also because they also need a sense of collective identity. The arms of the cities and the guilds that we've talked about up to this point are messages about the places and the people that they represent. What they, like the reason why all the professional guilds have very literal coats of arms is because it represents who we who they are. We are the winemakers, so here's some barrels. We are the wool guild, so here's a sheep. The purpose of it is not just because it's a convention that was established, but also corporate identity, identification with an organization or a class of people was an incredibly important part of medieval life. It was how you sort of were able to exercise political rights. It was how you were able to act like participate in the economy. And as a result, these were incredibly important associations to people. And so they needed a representation of that, just as people needed a representation of their family, something that transcends personal affection. So why was, why was the point of identification a visual symbol? Well, because this is a mostly pre-literate society. And so you don't have to be able to read to understand, like, this is the house of the Swarthouts yeah. in London, because it's, their sign is above the door. But interestingly, you know, it's not, it's not just a pre-literacy thing. Um, because, of course, literacy was incredibly important to how these these symbols were transmitted. If you wanted to get a, a stonemason to carve a tomb for you that had your coat of arms on it, you wouldn't necessarily be able to send him a picture. Because mm -hmm. there ain't no fax machines. <laughs> There's definitely a dichotomy where these symbols are made in large part to be recognizable to people, even those who aren't literate. And this might be, for instance, when you're watching a tournament... Mm. knowing who to cheer for and clap for because you see their symbol, or in battle, knowing whose flag to rally behind. Or who to shoot. <laughs> exactly. But then there's also the contrasting aspect that the people that regulate and create and delegate these symbols are literate, and literacy is an intrinsic part of um, how these symbols are managed because beginning in the High Middle Ages, you have armorial rolls. So these big, long scrolls of parchment paper that have drawings and descriptions and names um, of every single coat of arms and heraldic achievement. And this is the way of keeping track of who owns what symbols and uh, what's associated with which family. And I think that when we look at coats of arms, we can very easily sort of see them as, oh, well, that's a, we can dismiss them as, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a relic of a pre-literate society, a medieval society um, that was reliant on those kinds of visual representations to create senses of collective identity and, um, and, and, and corporate identity. Except I would argue, this is one of my, this is my absolute crank opinion. <laughs> um, one, well, one of my many, um, which is that I think that the, the, the successor to the medieval coat of arms and the best analogy that we have in med medieval society is the Europe is are the badges of European football teams or Absolutely, soccer teams yeah. to Americans because they follow the same structure. Mm -hmm. They usually have like they're they're about the same size. They usually have like a little like symbol that represents the place that they're from. They'll have a motto. They'll, I mean, quite often they will literally just be a coat of arms. It'll be the same format, like yes. Manchester City mm -hmm. um, or most of the uh, national football teams, for example. If you want to understand how to design a football, sorry, how, if you want to understand how to design a coat of arms in the actual intended sense from a medieval point of view, 
there is one resource that I would tell you to go and look up. <laughs> and it is the coat of arms of Peterhead FC. This is a team from a small fishing town in Scotland uh, who play in the fourth tier of Scottish football. And they're not very... <laughs> no, I'm not going to be mean about <laughs> that. Um, because I think this is, this, is, this is the thing you should have as the modern analog. This is the thing that you should be referring to <laughs> as a sort of... As a... As a, as a Approach. Okay, let's see. Let's more see. so, than, more so than the stuffy rules. Yeah, Olivia, would you describe oh, the logo of Peterhead FC? It's stunning. So it's a dark blue triangle <laughs> inside of uh, a light blue circle, and around the edges of the light blue circle, it says the blue tune, possibly <laughs> hinting at some sort of oceanic or aquatic reference, which is further emphasized by the contents of the dark blue triangle. <laughs> Which says Peterhead FC in a font that I'm going to say is possibly Arial condensed, <laughs> bold, uh, very lovely choice. I'm actually an Arial apologist, um, and it's got this beautiful graphic of like a fishing net kind of abstract representation. It's just sort of a grid, and then on top of that, it has a football with a little fish swimming in front of it. Um, is absolutely stunning. Or you could read it as that, or you can read it as the fish is, the playing, fish is football. playing football and hitting the fish, hitting the ball into the net of the goal. Yeah, you're right. It's a kind of double entendre to play on the concept of fishing nets and football goal yes. nets. Yes, wow. this is this is the legacy of the Middle Ages. I think I think you're correct. There is nothing. This is the spirit of coats of arms. It's got puns it's got little <laughs> visual jokes yes. but it also tells you about the heritage of the place that it's from this is a that fish is a weird medieval guy yes and it's it's endearing and i think that's you see all sorts of just absolutely endearing coats of arms over over time i mean the hen wearing trousers is great <laughs> even in the middle ages you have things like tadpoles and frogs yes and cats and all sorts of quirky animals uh, appearing on coats of arms and yeah it's a a means of personal identification i mean i've i've mentioned this on the podcast before and this is going to be like my least historically robust or historiographically <laughs> robust take but i'm going to deliver it repeatedly oh god um over the course of, you know, this entire podcast, um, many episodes. But I think there are some things that you need to accept are fundamentally human and possibly can't be rationalized. <laughs> and I think the love of cool symbols is just one of them. Yeah. Like, why do people see, why did the Romans see a sick golden eagle and think, yeah, I'm That's gonna me. charge into battle and die? You know, why do people rally around national flags or football team logos or, you know, other symbols of who they are? I mean, for instance, we've talked about how I'm a fiber artist, you know, people who are knitters and crocheters and other fiber artists get tattoos all the time of balls of yarn and sort of similar symbols. And people like things that represent who they are. It gives them a sense of collective identity. It sort of both mirrors how we perceive ourselves and it, you know, helps us create and project an identity. And I think that's very fundamentally human. I think that's really at the heart of, you know, heraldry. Hell yeah. I'm on the blue tune. I'm on the blue tune, mate. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the um, podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And I cannot stress enough that I want you guys to actually sit down, make your coats of arms. Yes, and then tag us. And tag us. Send them to us. DM us. We will post them. We yes. will also post pictures of the ones that we've made because they're stunning, frankly, and need to be seen by They're the pretty world. good. <laughs> yeah. That's an understatement. So, yeah, no, get, get drawing, you know... And please, please, please do post what you what you uh, have designed, because I would be very interested to see what people come up with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, then please leave us a review on Spotify or whatever podcast platform you use. If you haven't done so already, feel free to leave a little note in the Spotify um, answer box telling us what you think. And if... And we may read it out loud on the next episode, just like we're about to do now. This one comes from Bailey Beagles, who says, 
Weird Medieval Guys podcast. More like Really Good Medieval Guys podcast. Thank you, Bailey Beagles. Let's see, we've got a couple more. Um, thank you to Poncho Rosenfeld, who said, Th- Amazing episode, as always. Love that you guys actually opened a beer <laughs> during one of the skits. Now that's commitment to the bit. Keep it up. No problem, Poncho Rosenfeld. <laughs> Anything we can do to improve your listening experience. I hope you're going to drink this. Yes. <laughs> Good. And uh, thank you to Andy Jacobson, who says, Sub to only maids. <laughs> I will. <laughs> we love the modest milkmaid. We not based on anyone re- in real life, but based. purely yes, but based purely the result of Livia's favorite imagination. So yeah, thank you so much uh, again for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Yes, I am at Aaron P Tappers on Twitter and at Aaron on Blue Sky. I am at Weird Medieval on Twitter for uh, Weird Medieval Guys content and at Olivia underscore underscore MS. And we have a Discord, which we're actually going to put in the description this time instead of just mentioning it. Yes, follow us on Discord. Everything is fun on Discord. Um, and it's a really nice community where people are just sort of normal. Yes. People aren't, people aren't insufferable. If you're normal and not insufferable, join us on Discord. If you're not normal and insu- and not insufferable that's fine as well exactly. we actively encourage that <laughs> anyway well until next time until next time what are we going to do ne- hang on should we say tell them should we tell them what you're going to do next time we're going to do medieval bestiaries that's right we're going to do aminals it's a medieval planet earth medieval planet earth i got to start working on my david attenborough try right now no <laughs> i have too much respect for david and here we see a, a medieval um, dog. It looks like a modern dog. It's the same type of dog that you will see today. <laughs> this this symbolizes that medieval people also had dogs. <laughs> this man has been podcasting for several days <laughs> and yet has not found a mate. <laughs> <laughs>